Let us all pray together. Heavenly Father, Father, Mother, Mother, Friend, friend, Beloved God, God, Jesus Christ, Christ, Bhagavan Krishna, Krishna, Mahavatar Babaji, Babaji, Lahiri Mahashaya, Mahashaya, Swami Sri Yukteswaji, Revered Gurudev, Paramahansa Yogananda, Saints of all religions, I bow to you all. O Divine Mother, mold thou my life according to thy will. Bless me that I may never lose sight of thee, that my mind may ever keep turning toward thee in the midst of all of my activities. So many of you have come from all over, and I'm glad to be with you today. It's not possible for me to speak unless it comes from here. Whatever I have said through all these years is the result of the many years of training, of guidance, of classes, of study with Guruji, and the results also of my own communion with God and with our blessed Guru. When one embraces a teaching and when one accepts and understands the deep, lasting, unconditional relationship between the disciple and the Guru, then it creates a bond of communication That is not an easy relationship, and it is not a relationship that one takes lightly once that is established. I remember when I first met him in Salt Lake City, and I had indicated my wish to dedicate my life to God. One day, when we were sitting around him in his sitting room, he read a poem, and it, uh, it left a lasting impression on my consciousness, and that poem was Divine Friendship. That friendship should exist between husband and wife, between friend and friend, between child and parent, between guru and the disciple. It contains all of the essence of what that friendship means And that is the same relationship the devotee feels for God. It is unconditional. When Guruji gave that poem to me, then he said, when I went to my Guru's ashram, my Guru said to me, do you accept me as your friend and will you be my friend? And Master said to to him, yes. And then his guru said to him, even if I go astray, do you accept me? And master said to him, oh, you could never go astray. Of course, Sri Kutesuji said to him, no, that is not friendship. A friendship that is unconditional is what I seek. Do you give me that kind of friendship? Then master understood what he meant. That when two individuals or two or more individuals enter into a relationship, it should be without any condition. One doesn't make such commitments lightly, but when they're made, they're everlasting. One is no longer fickle. He remains steadfast. He doesn't flit idly from one teaching to another, from one religion to another, from one teacher to another. He seeks He uses his common sense, his discrimination, and he asks himself, does this teacher or this teaching have what I need? 
Does it satisfy my soul? And once he feels content with that answer, then he looks to the teacher. How do I accept this teacher? Do I find a feeling uh, of, of trust? Do I have confidence in him? Do I find that he answers all my questions? Maybe sometimes he's hard on me, but that's not important. The important point is, do I see in him one who has traveled the path and understands that path? When Guruji uh, asked me that question, do you accept me as your friend? I understood exactly what he meant. I was prepared to make that commitment that here is someone that I believe in, here is someone that I can trust, here is someone I know who knows God, here is someone that will never take advantage of my faith or my trust, here is someone to whom I can pour out my heart. And so I made that commitment to the path of self-realization, and to Paramahansa Yogananda. A guru is simply one who has trod that path, who knows that path, having trod it, and gone through the experiences of that path, and he is then capable of leading others in the right way. Such a one, we can go back to centuries ago and say that Jesus was such a guru. He had only 12 disciples, and one of them betrayed him. But so great was his spiritual magnetism, so great was his wisdom and his love, unconditional, that through those 12 disciples, through his teaching, he influenced centuries of followers. Isn't it so? So in the same way, they had that same unconditional love for their guru, even though at the end they felt the need to protect themselves. They fled or denied him. But that was the human side of their nature. And they could not be faulted for that. And so when one establishes that kind of relationship, then one tries always to keep in tune with that teacher. When we tune in with the will of a guru, a God-realized guru, it takes tremendous self-discipline. Why? Because our own will is guided by whims and bad habits acquired in this or past lives. And we all think we have free will. We don't. We're all impelled by some habits that we don't like and would like to overcome. I get letters all the time from such souls. How can I overcome this? How can I overcome that? It takes willpower. I remember once years ago, after I'd been in the ashram, and I tried my best to follow Gurdjie's will, and it was not easy. It was an overcoming, an overcoming of self. We didn't do anything without his consent. Some people used to think, that's too hard. It's, I remember one person saying to me, whom I loved very much in those early years, this kind of dis discipline is going to destroy your will. You will end up having no will at all. I said, on the contrary. It takes tremendous willpower, tremendous self-discipline in order to overcome your own whims and desires to follow another. But I believe in him. I believe in his relationship with God. I see that relationship with God. And therefore, I have accepted him as a teacher to guide me and discipline me if and when necessary. And as a result, that kind of relationship gradually brings you in tune with the wishes of the Guru. I remember in, the, in those early years, there were happy times, no question about it, because he was a very kind and compassionate and understanding, but very disciplined 
teacher. Sometimes I would go to my room and shed tears because I wanted to do my own thing. You understand? I would have my way. I can remember I had never been away from the family home, never, until I came to Mount Washington during the uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas holidays. And uh, being, having never been away from the family home, after a few months I became very homesick. I was very much attached to my mother and very homesick. And I asked Guruji, my mother wrote and said, can't you please come home? This happens all the time in our ashrams. Can't you please come home? I was anxious to go. I went to Guruji. Do you know what he said to me? No. <laughs> I accepted it, but I thought, why? Why? Why can't I go home? See what he was trying to do, and it's a subtle. Many don't understand that discipline. It's very subtle. He was trying to help me to broaden my concept of love, broaden my concept of family, not destroy it, but to broaden it. After about three months, he called me to him and said, now, would you like to go to your home? And I went to spend my first few weeks at home with the family members. I never forgot that discipline. But that gives you an idea. If you accept him, accept that training too. Now, there will be some gurus, and that has also come to my attention, who are not gurus who do not have that relationship with God, who do not have that communion with God. And then their whole wish is to dominate, and that is wrong. That is a great spiritual sin when someone pretends to be a guru. I have said that recently to somebody who claims he is a guru, and I said, this is a very dangerous statement to make and a very dangerous attitude for you to assume because that involves great self-realization to be a true guru. One who has walked with God, one who knows God, one who understands the fine pathway that one must trod because it is indeed sometimes like a razor's edge. And that is why I have such reverence for Karamahansa Yogananda, because he was that kind of guru. You were, I think we are all very fortunate because we were drawn to a true teacher. Someone asked me, what were some of his outstanding qualities? Well, there were many. The most outstanding, of course, was the love which he expressed for God, which I have never seen in any other human being, even in my visits to India. Perhaps the closest one to it was Ananda Moi Ma, the blissful mother whom I was privileged to know and draw near during my visits to India. But that doesn't mean to say there are no true gurus, but I would say they are few and very, very far between. A true guru does not take advantage of his disciples. He has nothing to gain. He wants nothing from them. And he always says, you may go any time. He never tries to hold. The door is wide open. You come of your own free will. If you leave, you go with my blessing. That's a real teacher. They don't hold anyone against their will. And such was he. His other qualities were this great love for God. It wasn't a love that was put on for his, for his disciples. He lived it. He walked in that consciousness. How many times through the years I have walked into his room, perhaps carrying some papers, or merely to see if I could do anything. Could I carry anything? Could I serve him in any way? And I would see him sitting quietly. He wasted no time, just silently with his eyes locked in that meditative 
state. Nobody was around. He wasn't trying to impress anyone. He was alone with his beloved God. And his whole mien reflected that. Sometimes he would be softly chanting to her in perhaps Hindi or Bengali or in English. Sometimes you would see tears rolling down his cheeks. Through all those years, I once said to some disciples, when I first came into the ashram, I put him on a pedestal, in my consciousness, of course. He never once stepped down from that pedestal. He was always someone so unique, so unique. And he didn't want our worship. I'll give you a story about that. He didn't want from us. He used to say, all I want from you, I want to see you in love with God. That's why I've come. I haven't come for anything from you. I have given you my unconditional love and friendship. I will never forsake you. There is nothing you can do that will cause me to turn away from you. I am here. And I remember thinking, isn't that like Christ? Wasn't he like that? He turned no one away. But he could also be fiery. When he felt one had done wrong and he thought that it would be helpful to lance that, that poison with a sharp word, he could do it. And you never forgot it. But you always knew that behind it was his love. You never felt any resentment, you, the ne in the next instant, I always marveled at that. He could be so fiery. And in the next instant, it was just as if nothing had ever happened. That taught me a great lesson. I saw that it never was deep. It was always on the surface. He remained always in that ever calm, ever conscious state of love for God. His other qualities outstanding were his unfathomable wisdom. He had such wisdom. He could talk on any subject. I used to see when devotees would come here, different doctors or scientists or musicians, and they would be talking about everything that interested them, which was their own profession. And he would be so interested, he would be asking questions, and then I would see subtly, quietly, he drew their minds back to one thing, God. Always he left everyone with that thought of God. And that was one of the inspiring uh, things about him. Whenever he was inviting devotees to dinner in Encinitas, and he loved to cook for the, for the members whenever they were there, I had the privilege of taking my little notebook and sitting at at the end of the table, writing. And I used to call them After Dinner Discourses by Guruji. <laughs> so many of those I remember and have kept. So those, his great forgiveness, he was, you couldn't do anything that he didn't say forgive. And he always said, why do you think, why must you think that God is going to punish you for all the things you've done wrong? That isn't the God that I know. God is a God of love. There is no sin or error that mankind could commit that he has not already thought of. Do you understand the point? Everything in this universe is the result of his will, not ours, or not of some other God. There is but one. His consciousness is universal. But what he wants to feel is that we will choose always that which is right. Each one of us knows what is right. In here, we were all endowed with a voice of conscience. Not one of us can say we do not know the difference between right and wrong. We know. If we do not know, it's because we have committed so many wrongs in our life that the voice has become silent, that it's drowned out. We need to listen to that voice more carefully. We need to become more aware of that voice. And we need to follow it, not just listen. It tells us 
how to behave in this world. So I've told you something of Guruji's uh, personality, great wisdom, great compassion, great love, great kindness, great forgiveness. I often thought of the word, suffer little children to come unto me, for of such is the kingdom of them. He was childlike, not childish, but he was childlike. Simple things of life meant everything. He enjoyed the simple things of life. He loved to laugh, and he loved to keep his disciples laughing. Now, I don't mean raucous laughter. I mean a laughter, a joy that springs from the heart. That was part of his nature. Yes, how to be in tune with him, and how have I carried on all these years? Perhaps it started with, with my reverence, my faith in him. Perhaps it started with my uh, efforts in meditation because I do, I do know that that is important. It is impossible for anyone to know God, don't care what religion they follow, if they do not have a time to commune with God. You can call it whatever you want, but there must be time set aside for that solitude, to build that inner life, to build that inner relationship with God. Without it, man cannot know peace. He might be seeking lots of pleasures, and he might be very busy in the world, but there comes a time before the end of life when all of those have no more importance. We lose interest in them. Then we say, I'm so empty. Why am I so empty? Because I never cultivated that relationship. Here, the very one upon whom I am totally dependent throughout my whole life, since I first entered that tiny cell in the mother's womb, from that very instant and before that, up to this time of my passing, that one I have been totally dependent upon. And isn't it amazing that that one we shut out of our lives? That is the tragedy. I, I, I tell you truthfully, I don't know how, I don't know how the world survives without it. And then when I get so many letters, see so many sad things where, where family, husbands and wives or children will write to me, their lives are so empty or they're caught up in drugs, or they're caught up in alcohol or other habits, and they have no reason to live. They don't want to go on living. Why? Because they have used these senses to pursue the wrong things in life. And it leaves an emptiness in the soul, emptiness in the mind, emptiness in the heart. To this day, when everyone else is retired, I go quietly into Master's Shrine alone. I don't want anyone else to know. First time I'm telling this. <laughs> I don't want anyone else to know. The relationship with God is a very sweet, innocent, beautiful, beautiful, joyous, loving relationship. And you treasure it. You want to hold it close to you. You don't want to talk about it. But every night I go into Master's and I have my meditation. What joy, what peace, what joy I find. And after that, then I pray for all of those who have asked for prayers because that's part of my life of service. And I know that if they are in tune, that they will be benefited. That's the way the law, the law works. Then when Guruji said, why don't you set aside one day a week for a longer meditation? Immediately. I didn't wait. Whenever he said something, I did it. Why? This is a valuable time. This is a valuable lesson I can learn. So I tried my best to follow. And so began those years of meditation, longer periods, now you will say, well, you can do it, but I can't. You can do it. 
You've got to want to do it. You've got to have the yearning to do it. To know God, you've got to have the yearning to know Him. You see what I mean? You must build that desire. And if you say, well, I can't, how do I build it? When there have been enough heartaches in one's life, when one has faced the disappointments of life, the heartbreaks of life, then one begins to say, well, the world isn't treating me right. Let me turn to Him. Isn't that a shame? We wait for that point. But it is true that suffering is the greatest teacher in the world if we take it with the right attitude. It can make us... I don't welcome it, and I don't believe in it, and I don't believe in these teachings that say we must suffer, I don't, and I don't invite it. I say that whatever comes in life, we must face it with courage. We must face it with faith. We must face it with a conviction that my God is with me. But how do we get that? Come back to it again. The need for a period of meditation. Ten minutes, 15 minutes. You will find if you do that, you will want to have more meditation. It doesn't make you neglect your family. Husbands and wives begin to understand and respect that need of each one for their quiet with God. Then there is a household that is full of more peace and happiness. And so after that, studying his teachings, working with him as I have for so many years, and then the training through the years, how many times he has called me to him. And I used to think, why doesn't he tell this to everyone else? I didn't want him to tell it only to me. I thought, what's he, why this? It never occurred that I would be sitting here today looking after this work. Never. If I had wanted it, it would have been wrong. But it was not part of my interest in life. And as a result, it came to me. At any rate, I have not forgotten anything that he ever taught me. I relive it every day. Why? Because I love living in the thought of all the wonderful truths that he gave. They are part of my consciousness now. And along with those has grown my own understanding. So that when I need to make a decision, I'll give you an example of that. Someone asked, has he come to you since? Yes, but I don't like to talk about those experiences. Yes, I have had experiences. But you know, we learned that if we talk about those, they lose something. Those sacred experiences we should protect. We should hold them to ourselves. When you tell them, there's a tendency to, look how great I am, God came to me. That's not, that's not the right attitude. Those who really love God, those who really enjoy a relationship with Him, they become, they want to be more silent. They want to remain more in that thought. Yes, if they can help someone, that is good. They want to do that. But they also become rather silent. They want to listen more to that voice of intuition. And then they're able to make decisions. How do you make decisions? Once Guruji said to some disciples, many years later, in fact a short time before he left his body, he had scolded me roundly in front of a group of people for something. And uh, I learned what he was trying to do. It took me a long time. It used to hurt me. How, do you, how would you like it if I suddenly started scolding you, pointing to all your faults in front of everyone? You'd be devastated. You would say, why she do this? Let her talk to me direct, but not before everyone. I reacted that way. Then one day I thought, does it matter? Does it matter? Are you concerned about what people think of you? Is that why you're here? Or are you, is, it, is it not more important that you be concerned about what God and Guru think of you? The moment I grasped that wisdom, forget it. From that moment on, I looked forward to him. I wanted him, because I wanted to test myself. And he did it, regularly. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> I remember once coming down in the elevator with him. He said, I am so sorry. I have scolded you so much in this life. I gave you the same training that my guru gave me. Only he said, my guru was much harder on me than I've been on you. Then he said, but I won't be here always. And I said, Master, you scold me through eternity. I am grateful for all that you have done for me. I am grateful. And uh, I have lived in that thought. I am grateful. Not a day goes by that I don't thank God for the blessed privilege of devoting my life like this and of having the opportunity to serve his disciples, not mine. I am grateful. I don't mind what people think of me. I can't be bound by what people think of me, isn't it? Let me be bound by, am I striving to live by truth? Am I striving to live by noble qualities? Am I striving to be always fair, always just, always compassionate? I'm not perfect, but am I striving? Yes, I am. That's part of my, that's part of my effort in life. I want God. I want to reflect the teachings of my guru, which are the teachings through which God expresses himself to us. Yes. And so after he had scolded me and I felt such peace inside and I went to perform whatever task he had given me, you know what he did? I never knew this during his lifetime. He turned to the others and he said with tears in his eyes, see how she behaves? It's always been like that. You all can learn from her. No matter how I scold, no matter what I say to her, she always remains the same. What a tribute. What badge could the world give me? that could have equaled those words. And I always hold to that. I strive always to keep in tune with him by my devotion, by my remembrance of him, by the things that he said, by the things that I recorded, and by that which has come to me through my own spiritual growth. And so when it comes time to make decisions, these monks and nuns will tell you that my first thought, and I've told them all, the first thing when I have a decision to make, my first thought will be to them, what did our master want? I'm not interested in what I want. It has no meaning. I am only interested here. I am here to do his will. I am here to carry out his wishes. I find his wishes are my wishes. I have no contradictory uh, viewpoint in anything he ever taught. I understand it. I see it. I see how it has transformed my own life and the lives of so many of these wonderful devotees and so many of you. That's what attunement does. Whoever will think me near to him I shall ever be near. I live by those words too. I believe in them. I have the faith in them. I know it to be a fact. Why? Because I don't let go of that. I don't, I don't get lost. Life is very simple. Simple clothing. Simple food. Don't receive a salary. What freedom. Never want to think of having money for my duties to serve. No, not. In India, when I used to travel and devotees would put money, I couldn't even touch it. I don't want, I don't want to feel that anyone is giving to me. Whatever you give, I share. That's just my life. And so, Attunement is everything on the spiritual path. I'm taking you much deeper than, you, than, is, than is uttered in the, in, in, the, in the churches. I know that. 
But you were here, you must be ready for it, or you wouldn't be here. I'm trying to touch your hearts in a way that you will go back to your homes and feel an upliftment and a belief that doesn't mean the world is going to become rosy. It means that you're going to have the spiritual strength, the understanding to carry on, knowing you have a friend, you have a teacher. He said, whether I am here or whether I am in the other world, I will reach down from heaven to help those who strive. In another way, he said, I want to return again and again to this world to pick up any faltering brother and carry him back to my father's house. That was what he believed. That's the way he lived. And so, when you meditate, someone has written to me and said, my mind is so restless. Yes, I understand that. Everybody writes that to me. You have to, and, and you have to ask yourself, why is it so restless? Because you don't really make an effort to, to have a time just for him. Or let me give you this illustration that Gurdjie used to give. Our minds are like a, a lake. And the thoughts and the sensations that pummel us all the time are like pebbles. And they keep going into this lake and causing endless ripples, ripples, ripples on that lake of the mind. Those are the result of restlessness. Now, if we can still that restlessness, if we can begin to pull the attention, the concentration together into one central point, then gradually those pebbles, pebbles that have been falling on the lake cease to fall. And that lake becomes crystal clear. And that crystal clear lake, you begin to hold, behold the mooned face of your own soul. That restlessness is something that we have to overcome. Not difficult. Make it, don't make it so difficult. When you sit to meditate, incidentally, I was, I can't tell you how pleased Guruji was to see how you all sat. Such stillness, such wonderful peace radiating throughout those several thousand devotees in at the, uh, at the, in the hall where I spoke last Friday. That was remarkable. I'm proud of every devotee there. That's the way it should be. And there should be more of that. It isn't enough to talk about God. Now it's time to think about Him. Now it's time to feel Him. And don't think He's going to come out of the clouds. Don't look for those kinds of experiences. They will come if it's His will. You understand? Look for him in little ways. When you least expect, you will find some spark of his response if you were sincere. Sincerity is the very foundation. No imagination, just sincere, devotional attitude. When you sit to meditate, just think to yourself, one day I must give up this body. Now this shouldn't be a negative thought. It's a realistic thought. One day I must give up this body. Why don't I? And all these things that are troubling me, all these problems, all these personalities, all these business problems, all these conflicts, in an instant, they're gone. It's shocking to see how a person will be talking to you the next moment gone. You've all had that experience. What happened? All the responsibilities, everything ceased in an instant. So we put, why put so much attention, all of our attention here? No, it's not realistic. It's not, it isn't practical. 
So when we sit to meditate, we simply think, I am closing my mind to this world. These worries, these troubles, these problems with my children, my husband, my wife, my family, my neighbors, my world, they don't exist. Let me just think at this moment that the only reality is God. He is my existence. He is the father, the mother, the friend, the beloved that I turn to. Having thought that thought, then begin your practice of Hong So Now your mind is going to keep pulling away because habit is there. You're not used to being still. When you're still, you're only used to going into the subconscious world, which is sleep. Man generally knows only two states, activity, sleep. We must not let the mind go to sleep. We must resist that, and you can. How do you resist? Every time your mind wanders away from that hongsa, bring it back. Be patient. The only difference between the saint and the sinner is that the saint never gave up trying. No matter how many times he failed, it doesn't matter. As long as I am alive, I go on trying. I try harder. I make greater effort. Striving, striving one day to attain. And that is what happens. So then, as I have said before, the time comes when you will find glimpses of such wonderful peace. When there is no desire to breathe, you don't force it in or out. You see those, those moments of such tranquility. You're beginning to behold that world of peace, which is all around us. But we're so caught up in our senses and in worldly thoughts that we aren't aware of that. Know ye not that ye are gods and that the Spirit of God dwelleth within you? This is what we are. We will not know it as long as we pursue 100% all of our attention outward. We have to take time and give a portion of our time through the day or the night or early dawn to thinking about God, to talking to God, to praying to God. Then you gradually see how much you are changing. So never be discouraged and say, well, why don't I make any progress? Progress also consists, my dears, not only of what you feel in meditation. Progress consists of trying to be a better human being. Progress consists of learning to behave. Progress consists of trying to be more compassionate, trying to be more understanding, trying to be kinder, practicing greater calmness in your lives. You know all the qualities that you need to learn. If you fail, don't be discouraged. Keep on. One day to achieve. It is not difficult unless you think it is difficult. And that's the point. I can tell you it brings greater peace and happiness. The next time you feel like doing something you know is wrong, remember these words and say, no. I'm not going to do that mean thing or that unkind thing. Someone is mean to me, I'm not going to retaliate. Most of the world wants to retaliate. No, that's not the way. Pull back. I, my philosophy is, why should I upset myself because somebody is mean to me? No. What I will do, I will say, God bless you. And I'll go on thinking, God bless you. And I'll go on speaking kindly of you. And I'll go on thinking kindly of you. Isn't that the right way? That's what Christ taught. That was Master's philosophy. I have seen him time and again, even up to the last few days of his life, manifesting that wonderful, wonderful quality of forgiveness and understanding. And someone asked me, what about the young people today? And I know that's a major problem. 
how to help them through this very difficult period when, uh, when there is so much that's wrong in the world. And I was thinking about that this morning. And it goes back to the parents again. It goes back to the harmony in the home again. It really does. If the, if the parents... And then it goes back further than that. It goes back to, should I have married this person or that person? Basic problem is, in this age, this notion that uh, sexual freedom was the right way is, is wrong. It is wrong. I must tell you. I cannot emphasize that enough. This freedom is being abused. And everyone who, who looks upon that as a, as a right of every human being is hurting himself first, destroying his peace of mind. Look at these young people that are committing suicide. Too much. Too much. Too much sex. Too much drugs. Too much everything. No guidance. No love in the home. Nothing to nurture their souls so that they say, well, what's the point in living? Is this all there is to it? Failure is in the home. So it has to begin in the home. They have to be nurtured there. Not forced. They have to be nurtured. And then I have read somewhere that it's the wealthiest children who go wrong. Wherever too much things are given, and they think, this is going to take the place of my giving love? Never. Things will never do it. There has to be a personal relationship between the parents and the child. An understanding relationship. Not when we get mad knocking them down or driving them out. All you can do as parents is expose them to the right understanding. Not nagging at them, but it begins with their childhood. It begins where they feel they can come to you. You have to struggle for understanding yourself. But it begins with understanding. It begins with love. It begins with their feeling that I can talk to my mother. I can talk to my father. They'll understand me. And they do. They may not agree with me, but they will understand. They try to help me. That's where it begins. So that when they go out into the world, they have had a certain environment built around them. So that when they go out into the world, they are not affected by it. They are not affected by it. They will choose more carefully their companions. They will discriminate about their companions. But you must also realize one more thing. You have to do your best. You have to ask, have I done my best? Am I doing my best? And then, my dears, having done that, having exposed them to your love, your wisdom, your understanding, your patience, your forgiveness, then you have to allow them to go to make their mistakes. You can't live their lives for them, can you? No. You can only do one thing. Do the best you can and be there when they need you. But as you had to learn through your mistakes, so they will learn through theirs. Pray for them, love them, help them. But my dears, begin. Don't wait till they're eight, nine, ten. Begin from the beginning. And encourage them, above all. Don't force them, because sometimes it's said that the children of ministers are the worst offenders because they're forced. I have to encourage people. I have to encourage people.
have to expose them, but not by too much talk. Your example is going to be greater than any talk. And we must pray for it. It is a sad, sad situation, but uh, it's a phase. The cycle comes back again and again and again, and then it moves on. The cycle now is part of that. But gradually, people will become tired of, of, of over, overindulgence. They'll be moving towards something else. You understand? The Lord never leaves us forever in that one cycle. And we must cooperate. In other words, there, let's put it this way. There needs to be more cooperation with God. Will you remember that? <laughs> more cooperation with God. <laughs> he needs our help. <laughs> I want to read, and this was written by Guruji. I was there when he wrote it. It's called, When I Am Only a Dream. He was in Encinitas writing. One evening he was sitting in his room at his desk. Some of us were gathered around quietly meditating or maybe studying, reading. And he was writing and suddenly he said, you want to hear this? And I, we said, yes, Master. What is it? And he said, I've just begun to write a poem. It's titled, When I Am Only a Dream. He'd write a few lines and then read it to us. He'd write a few more lines and then he'd read it to us. It was all coming from his own consciousness. And so I want to read it to you. And this I believe in. I remember as he read the whole thing to us, I remember thinking, and this is what attunement means, I vow, my Guru, you will never be only a dream to me. You will never be just a dream to me. I know. I know you are with me. As often as I try to do good, as often as I try to follow your wishes, I know you are with me. I don't doubt it. So let me read this to you. I come to tell you all of him and the way to encase him in your bosom and of the discipline that brings his grace. Those of you who have asked me to guide you to my beloved's presence. I warn you through my silently talking mind, or speak to you through a gentle significant glance, or whisper to you through my love, or loudly dissuade you when you stray away from him. But when I shall become only a memory or a mental image or silently speaking voice, when no earthly call will ever reveal my whereabouts in unplumbed space, when no shallow entreaty or stern stentorian command will bring from me an answer, I will smile in your mind when you are right, and when you are wrong, I will weep through my eyes, dimly peering at you in the dark, and weep through your eyes perchance, and I will whisper to you through your conscience, and I will reason with you through your reason, and I will love all through your love. When you are able no longer to talk with me, read my whispers from eternity. Eternally through it, I will talk to you. Unknown, I will walk by your side and guard you with invisible arms. And as soon as you know my beloved and hear his voice in silence, you will know me again more tangibly than you knew me on this earth plane. And yet, when I am only a dream to you, I will come to remind you that you too are not but a dream of my heavenly beloved. And when you know you are a dream as I know now, we will ever be awake in him. Isn't that beautiful? And doesn't it have great meaning for all of us? Let us pray together. 
Bless me, O Lord. Bless my family. Bless my loved ones. Bless my neighbors. Bless my community. Bless my country. And bless my world. Om Shanti. Peace. Amen. God bless you all.